together this morning in the Word, in a passage from the Old Testament book of Micah that is as relevant today as it was on that day when Micah penned it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let's stand together, and I invite you to say this with me this morning. Micah 6, 6 through 8. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to Him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Micah 6, 6 through 8. Good stuff. Let's sing together. Oh, my God. 
seated. I invite you to worship with us around this altar. We have so much to be thankful for. For he has saved us, he has redeemed us, he set us free. Father, it seems like every day there's a news story or an article talking about somebody that wandered off or was kidnapped, missing. We get those warnings, reminders on our phones, the amber alerts and the silver alerts pointing out a, an age of a person and a description of a person and they're missing. And we're all encouraged to keep our eyes open to try to help find them. Unfortunately, so many times they are with a lot of people looking in a short order. They're found and given back to their families. But Father, probably for every one whose name gets called, there are at least a hundred or more out there whose names never get called. They're lost and nobody's missed them yet. They're lost and more frighteningly, nobody cares. And maybe the years from now we find a skeleton somewhere and with DNA testing we discover oh it was that person that that was missing that nobody really was looking for and what a sad sad place to be when you can just disappear and and nobody knows and further nobody cares but we've been sitting here this morning and singing songs and we'll be going to a passage of scripture and in both the songs and in your word we are reminded that when we were lost when we were cut off from you, when we had wandered away from you, you never stopped looking. And you enlisted your word, you enlisted your Holy Spirit, you enlisted circumstances to come after us and to find us. And I'm so glad today, Father, that, that we worship a God who knew us and loved us and sought us out. And I'm glad to be part of a church that has a mission to still go looking for those who are lost and help us, Father, to never be that body of believers who doesn't care, who's so satisfied, so smug in our own salvation that we don't give a flip about that person out there who doesn't come to church, who never has heard the name of Jesus, who's never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I guess today, Father, I want to say thank you for not giving up. Thank you for not quitting your search. Thank you for finding us and loving us. In your Son, Jesus Christ, and it's in His name we pray. Amen.
I guess it wasn't just them. Maybe, maybe it's that gliding landing that brought you to a kind of a sacred moment there and you were just speechless and motionless and your hands wouldn't go together or nothing would come out. Oh, it's going to be a long sermon. Okay. If you keep up, you know, and try to follow along, you know that a lot of my preaching comes in series. More often than not, it's in a particular book of the Bible or a section of Scripture, and we'll just work our way through that very methodically. Sometimes it's a subject, like May, typically I usually string together a series of sermons connected to family, and they are still scripture-based, expositional sermons, but, but they're 
based around a, a theme. So today, I am beginning a series from the book of 1 Corinthians. I can't tell you how long it's going to take. A while, more than likely. Uh, so if you come back next year about the same time, it's your time of the year to come to church, and I'm still in 1 Corinthians, don't be surprised if that's the case. We'll be farther down the road, but we'll still probably be in it for a little while. And let me tell you, let me tell you why, and I'll, I'll make this quick and get, get to the sermon as quickly as I possibly can. I am intrigued, perplexed, puzzled, frustrated, aggravated, all at the same time, with what's going on out there and in here. Trying to answer questions, what do you think about that, preacher? What should we do about, how should we respond to, well, where does the Bible say, how do we react to that given our heritage as believers? Great questions. And they used to come occasionally, and now they're coming daily, multiple times throughout the day. Not just from you, folks outside the church, but most from myself. I'm asking myself those questions. When Paul wrote this letter to the church at Corinth, he was writing to a particular community. And uh, they were in a unique place. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, but they were caught in between, between this faith that they had found in Jesus Christ. It was real. It was the real deal for them. This was not just church membership. This was not just uh, subscribing to a particular philosophy. They had met Jesus Christ largely through the witness and the ministry of the Apostle Paul, and their lives had been changed. And that's that's a clear testimony that we're going to find in Paul's letter, an acknowledgement, a given. You guys have met Jesus Christ and your lives have been changed. Now, when their lives were changed, they saw things differently. They evaluated life differently. They approached life differently, but they still lived at the same address. And Corinth was an interesting place. Let's talk about that for a second. Located on this little isthmus of land between the Greek mainland and the Greek peninsula. A harbor on their left, a harbor on their right. So they were ideally situated for a trade route. And boy, did it work. They would come into that eastern harbor with their goods and they would unload them. They would be carried across the isthmus of land, reloaded and put on another boat, ship, and carried to its destination, which was so much easier than going all the way around the peninsula and risking the weather at that particular time. So it's a trade route. It's a very healthy, vibrant, robust trade route. And with any trade route, you get a lot of different influences. You get people from all over the world, and, and they came to that place. You get a lot of different cultures, you get a lot of different languages, a lot of different beliefs, habits of life. They were all there, concentrated in the city of Corinth. As a result of some of the people who came to and through, some stayed. And, and so there were also a multiplicity of uh, gods who were worshipped, temples for Egyptian deities because of the connection with Alexandria, Egypt, and the trade from there to the, the eastern routes. On top of that, because of its ideal location, it was the host for the annual Isthmian Games, Olympic-like games. Look forward to these games. They looked forward to all the people who would come and compete in the competitions, but also to all those who would come to watch. And so again, it brought a great crowd of people this time looking to have a good time. And when you, when you have visitors coming to your city, uh, you've got to provide them a good time. And so they did. It was the place where you could go to have a good time. If, if we were naming it today, they didn't name it this back then, but if we were naming it today, we would probably call it Sin City. It would probably be a bit like Vegas or New Orleans on its worst day or best day, depending on your perspective. It just had a lot going on. There were a lot of attractions. There were a lot of elements that influenced life in that community. And that wasn't all that went on, but that was there. It was a powerful force, and the church was planted right smack dab in the middle of all of this activity. 
in the middle of this very cosmopolitan community, there is this group of people who come to faith in Jesus Christ, whose lives are different, whose perspective is different because of that relationship with Jesus Christ, and they have got all kinds of questions. Corinthians, first and second, are answers to a lot of those questions. Now, unfortunately, we didn't get the list of questions. That wasn't preserved for us. All we have is the list of answers. And so we kind of have to figure out what the questions were. But these are very practical letters that, that address situations that were going on both inside the church and outside the church. Answers to the question, what do we do? How do we handle, how should we react when, and, and here are the answers. Now, I gave, I'm giving this series, this overarching theme, when worlds collide, because that's what happened. Their, their new world, this kingdom of heaven world, this following Jesus world, on a daily basis is colliding with the world they live in, the community that is home for them. And, and every day when they leave and they go out and they go to work and, and they listen and they observe, those worlds collide. And, and the question is, what do we do? How do we handle this and not be obnoxious, not be irrelevant, not be something other than what we are called to be? What do we do when worlds collide? Well, this morning, uh, we, will, we will begin at the very beginning. I'm not going to skip the introduction because I think there's an important resource here for us as we get started in this letter of 1 Corinthians. When worlds collide, as Paul introduced the letter and reintroduced himself to that congregation, Paul called as an apostle of Christ by the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When worlds collide. I have arranged the sermon around three questions. They're not hard questions. They're pretty simple. I hope you'll keep on answering them as you leave. And here's the first one. Why should I listen to this? And I guess that's, that's a fair question on any given Sunday. I, I don't assume for one moment that when you come in here uh, that you really care about what I'm going to talk about. That's not an assumption that I feel at liberty to make because I, you, you come for a variety of reasons and your face shows that. I mean, some of you, if you're as miserable as your face looks, God bless you. You come because somebody invited you, somebody twisted your arm, somebody manipulated you, you feel like it's the right thing to do. There's a lot of different reasons that we come. But, but this is the question, why should I listen to this? When they opened up that letter and they began to read that letter, I think they had to, they had to wrestle with this. Why should I even pay attention to this? Why should I uh, care about what Paul has to say to us at this moment? Well, part of that answer is going to come in his very introduction of himself. Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Who is this man? I mean, we know we can read his testimony, particularly in the book of Acts, and find out that he was a, he was a very devout man, very religious, a, a Jew's Jew. But at the same time, he was very intelligent and he was very wealthy. He was well situated in life, very much a part of the order of his day. So much so that, that when he and other religious leaders got wind of this group of people that were <sighs> rocking the boat, an upstart religious movement. They called it people of the way, followers of Jesus Christ. It incensed him. It angered him. And he volunteered for duty. He would do everything he could to stamp out the people of the way. There's no place in our religion for followers of Jesus Christ. You say, well, how could he have done that? It was Jesus. But it was different, y'all. It was something different. We don't do well with different. We like routines now, some of you are a little bit more adaptable, a little bit more flexible than others of us. The older we get, the more inflexible we become. Uh, things just have to be a certain way. Uh, I grew up with that. I mean, that's, that, those were my roots in that, that Baptist church that I went to. You had a hymnal, the 1956 Baptist hymnal, blue bound cover. And you were going to sing every song out of that book. 
and you knew which songs you were going to sing because on the left side of the auditorium, up on the wall behind the choir loft, there was a little tote board, and it had numbers inside it, numbers of every hymn you were going to sing that Sunday in the order in which you were going to sing them, and you didn't deviate from that order. On the other side of the auditorium behind the choir loft, there was another tote board up there, and it told you how many people had been in Sunday school that morning, how many people had been in training union the week before, how much money was given, and depending on the number of lines, they'd tell you how many were on time and, and give you all the vital statistics each Sunday. That's what you did if you were the Sunday school superintendent. That was your job. You were the numbers man or woman. And then next to that was the church covenant, a large scroll-looking document that reminded all of us what we practiced together. Had sections in there about backbiting, declaring that we would not be backbiters. Just under that, there was a, a prohibition of the consumption and sale of alcohol. You notice we don't have a church covenant. We enjoyed backbiting and drinking too much. We took it down a long time ago. If you deviated from anything that was the standard, you risk losing your job. A lot of preachers lost their job. I remember the first time we sang Do Lord in church. Some of you don't even know Do Lord. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord. Well, that wasn't in the Baptist hymnal. And we had some folks who thought we were all going to hell the Sunday we sang Do Lord for the first time because it was not in the Baptist hymnal. But the, the point is, it was different. And these folk of Paul's ilk couldn't stomach different. It was insurrectionist. It was against establishment. And so he was on his way to, to handle another little group of the people of the way when he met Jesus. Oh, it was dramatic, more dramatic than probably most of our salvation experiences. He's riding down the road on his horse when he is struck down by a blinding light, knocked him off of his steed and also blinded him. And in that moment of physical blindness, for the first time, he heard a voice from heaven, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why, brother, are you fighting me so bad? And in that period of physical blindness, his spiritual eyes were open, and Saul of Tarsus became Paul the Apostle and found Jesus Christ. He got saved, and in that, that moment of being saved, it wasn't just that he joined the church. It wasn't just that he got baptized. It was that in that encounter with Jesus Christ, it all changed. The way he saw the world, the way he saw himself, the way he saw life, it began to change. It, it set in motion a process, and he described that process. He said not only was he uh, called out by the Lord, but he was called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, called God saved him because God had a plan for his life. And that's not unique. If you are here today and you would say, Clint, I know without a doubt that I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and I would say to you, then I know without a doubt that God has a plan for your life. Because he doesn't just save us and say, here, sit here until I get back. He saves us for a reason, for a purpose. He made it clear to Paul. It didn't, didn't happen immediately. He made it clear to Paul that he, he called him out uh, to, to be saved, to follow him, to be sent, called as an apostle. And that's what that New Testament word means. Apostle means one sent. And so he was commissioned to go and to represent Jesus Christ now as a follower of Jesus Christ, to go. And he was going to be a missionary to the Gentile community. That was a big community. In stark contrast to the Jewish community who increasingly rejected Jesus Christ, the Gentile community increasingly opened their arms, eyes, hearts, minds to Christ. And Paul felt the liberty and even the responsibility to go and to plant churches telling people about Jesus Christ. And he did that among the Gentiles. And he said, all of this is by the will of God. None of this is his doing. None of this was his design, his plan. This is God at work in him, sending him out because he'd changed his life. Why should we listen to this? You see, our, our common experience of grace in Christ is our binding agent. It, it is that that holds us together. It's not just that we, you show up here on Sunday morning at a particular time. I mean, there's a frustration in our church uh, that, that you don't know a lot of the people who come to church at 930 in the morning. You realize that? There's a whole different group of people. 240 people sat in this room this morning at 930. 
And, and some of them you pass on the way out that door, some on the way out that door, some on the way out that door, some of them you never see. It presents some interesting conversations in town. Hey, how are you doing? Fine. What's your name? Oh, it's so-and-so. Where do you go to church? I go to First Baptist Church. Huh, really? So do I. Never see you there. Which service do you go to? 930? I go to 1045. Oh, we need to get together sometime. By the way, Sunday night is a great time for you 930ers and 1045ers to get together. Just saying. Okay. But anyway, it, it's not the time of the service that binds us together. It's not, it's not that we all come from identical backgrounds because we don't. It isn't that we all have similar kinds of jobs because we don't. It, it isn't any of that that is our binding agent. It is our experience of grace by faith in Jesus Christ that brings us together and keeps us together, ties us together as the body of Christ we are called, as Paul was called, not, not just saved to wait, but, but called to live a particular life. Our salvation is more than an ecclesiastical transaction. It's a calling into a life, again, that's designed by God. He has a purpose for your life. And though we're not called apostles, we have been commissioned. We are being sent out into the world. Some of us, few of us, are called to vocational Christian service, called into ministry, we would say, and we would at times kind of make that a very small circle. But the reality is all of us who are saved are called into ministry. Mine takes place a lot here. Yours can take place and should take place in that place where you live, in that place where you work, in those circles that you circulate in. That is your field of ministry. And unfortunately for me, fortunately for you, sometimes your field of ministry is bigger than mine. You run into more lost people in a day's time than I do in a month of Sundays. You see people whose lives are messed up on a much more regular basis than I do because I don't know what it is about the preacher. When people see the preacher coming, they always straighten up and fly right. I mean, I have seen beer put back in the case, cigarettes back on the rack, lottery tickets given back to the clerk because the preacher's in the room. You know, I don't worry about me. I'm going to have a little fun with you, but I can't send you to hell. I mean, I, I can't. And, and, you know, you are called as much as I to minister in that place that God has given to you. Commissioned. And this is God's will, God's plan. That's why we should listen to this. But why, why second question, why should I be concerned about these things? Why should they even be on my radar? Paul early on makes that clear. He identifies himself and what really changed his life and why this is important to him and should be important to us. And, and then he goes further and, and lets us know why we ought to be concerned about these things. This is targeted at, given to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who've been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Why should I be concerned about these things. Paul gives us a little bit of a, a perspective here. Two things that, that jump out at me. Number one, it reminds me, us, that we are not in this alone, that the church is so much bigger than 260 people sitting in this room at 1045 on Sunday morning. It's every person who has called on Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Every person who has prayed and asked him to forgive their sin and to give them his eternal life. Every person, whether they are black or white or brown, whether they speak English or a foreign language, whether they live in this country or on the other side of the globe, whether they worship in a place that looks like this or out in the wide open or in, a, in an underground cavern, whether, whether they live like we live or live in radically different ways, it doesn't matter if they have called on the name of Christ as Lord and Savior. They are your brother, your sister. They are a part of our church, the church. And one day when we all get to heaven, they're going to be there with us. But it's hard to get that group together. You ever, know, ever notice that? We could send out a notice even on Facebook and say, hey, all, all the church, let's sit together next Sunday morning. It doesn't happen. And so there are these local expressions of the church. That's what we are. We are a local expression of that larger church. We are First Baptist Church in Mount Pleasant, Texas. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And, and so we, 
we embody that reality in this place that God has given to us as they did in that place that God gave to them. He planted them in Corinth in a difficult place, in a challenging place, but he planted them in that particular place to be his presence in that place. Why should we be concerned about these things? We ought to be concerned because we are the church the called out ones, the presence of Christ in our world. And that's not a reason for us to, if you got them, put your thumbs under your suspenders and thrust out your chest with arrogant pride. It's not that at all. But it is the recognition that God saved me for a reason. God called us together for a reason, and, and we don't want to miss it. We don't want to miss it. We are the presence of Christ in our world, located right here in Mount Pleasant, in Titus County, in the great state of Texas, yes, but this is our base of operation this isn't where it all happens. You know, I couldn't braggadociously say to anybody who walked in here for a tour on Tuesday, come on, let me, let me show you where it all happens. Ah, uh -uh. this is not where it all happens. This is our base of operation. This is where we come to find encouragement. This is where we come to find truth. This is where we, we come to find fellowship. And, and energized by that, emboldened by that, we are propelled out of this place into the world where it all happens where the worlds collide. And so it was for Paul. You see, the truth is on any given day, members of this body that gather here are scattered around our community, scattered around our state, scattered around the nation, and even around the world. As this group of students was walking around the boroughs of New York City last week, a long way from home, in a radically different place, Though they were in New York and we were here, they were still a part of you and me. More importantly, they were a part of Christ wherever we go. And that's why this is so very important. We have been and are being, here's Paul's word, we are being sanctified, which means we've been chosen and set aside for a particular purpose. Chosen, set aside for a particular purpose. What is that purpose? Well, for some it, it is... It's social. I mean, I, and I get that. It, it's at times good to come to church and catch up. And I see you talking in the hallway, and some of you talk before church, some of you talk after church, some of you talk during church. You're catching up and, and just kind of yeah, tell me what's been going on, and that's wonderful. We have fellowships. We get together and we eat. It's just a, it's a thing that we do. We sit around tables and we eat good food and, and we fellowship. And, and that's a wonderful aspect of church, but that's not all there is to church. Benevolent purposes, well, that exists. We try to help people who are down on their luck, people who are in trouble, people who don't have anybody else to look to. We, we do want to help them, but benevolent purposes aren't our primary reason for being. Political reasons, oh, in these days, we are encouraged by some to be nothing more than political action committees. Let's get our vote together and vote our candidates so we can have a, a voice in the political realm of our nation. We are not a political action committee. We will never be a political action committee. We need to go vote. We need to pray about who we vote for and why we vote. But we're never going to be a political action committee. Why do we exist? For one reason. And it's a spiritual reason. Other things are, are kind of encapsulated in this. But there's a, a, a spiritual reason that we exist. We have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, set aside for his purposes. It means two things. Sanctification is a, is a his part thing. It's, it's his choosing us. And y'all, that that's so good. That's so good to, to know that he, he picked me. He chose me. Many of us grew up in the playground era of sports. And at, at every recess, there was time enough to choose teams, typically just two and the burliest, biggest, fastest, best athletes typically ended up being the choosers. The rest of us were the choosees. And then they would begin to pick us quickly because we didn't have a lot of time. So they began to call names. And at that stage in my life, I wasn't the physical specimen that I am now. I was, I was little. I was slow. I wasn't overly coordinated. Had a flat top. 
It was held together with copious amounts of butch wax, and it didn't take long out on the playground to, to collect a large amount of dust in that butch wax that really cut down, had a lot of drag, and it slowed me down, slowed me down a lot. And so invariably, as the teens were being picked, I'd be out there and I'd be thinking to myself, even saying out loud, oh, dear God, don't let me be last, don't let me be last. I didn't want to be first. I knew that was outside the realm of possibility because all the, the studs and the studettes, there were girls that were much more athletic than I at that time, and they were going to be picked and all standing over there with their arms crossed, staring at the rest of us people. <laughs> don't let me be last. Don't let me be last. But in many, on many occasions it was. And at that point it wasn't that you were picked. It was that you were the last one standing there and they would say, oh, I guess we are stuck with you. You knew what that meant. You were never going to touch the ball. They were never going to pass the ball to you. They expected you, and, and usually uh, Stud's instructions was, Clint, you go stand over there, way a little further, back up. That's good. That's good. Huh? What? Anyway, it, it was, it, that's the way it went. Imagine my relief when I realized that God wasn't going to say to me anywhere along the way, oh, I guess we're stuck with you. But there was that moment in my life, as there was in yours too, if you were saved, when God found you, and he looked at you and he said, Clint, Myra Sue, Mike, I choose you. Come on, I want you. It wasn't automatic. It wasn't at that minute that we were swept off our feet and carried into this Christian oblivion. It was at that moment that we realized he has chosen us and we get to respond, yes, Lord, thank you. Thank you for picking me and saving me and giving me your eternal life. You say, well, that's part of it, sanctified, set apart by him in that choosing. But, but then there is that reality on a daily basis. We recognize I'm saved. We are his. Remember, we're in two worlds. We're living in our real world life. We're going to work. We're, we're carrying on with our family. And so now I've got to make choices about my time and my money and my commitments. And so it is that on a daily basis, I've got to look in that mirror and, and realize that my God is still there with me and he's calling me out to trust him and to walk with him. And so I get to say on any given day, it's my choice. God, I choose today. I choose today to walk with you and to follow you today. I want to be on your team. I want to be counted for you. That's the process of sanctification, increasingly being set aside by God, our setting aside ourselves for God's purposes in our life. Hmm. We don't want to miss our opportunity. If you're saved, you're not going to lose your salvation. You might wander off and have time out and time away, you'll not lose your salvation. But I'll tell you what you will lose. You'll lose opportunity. Some have just come around once because we, this is not just a beer slogan. This is just the reality. You only go around once in life. You realize that when this hour is spent, it's 1139. I'm going to quit around 1145. Do you realize that when this hour is spent, we can't do it again? It's done. It's over. So because you only go around once in life, you better be grabbing more than gusto. We need to be living purposefully, intentionally. Isaiah wrote this down in Isaiah chapter 6. It was in the midst of his description of his call experience. And, and God spoke to Isaiah and asked this question, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? It's a free will thing. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And in that moment, Isaiah was feeling pretty low. There had been some woe is me statements in that scripture. But as answer to that question, who will I send and who will go for us? Isaiah stepped forward and raised his hand and said, Here I am, Lord, send me. And I think every day the question comes, all right, who, who, who can I send today? And if we're listening and paying attention, we get the opportunity, we can say, here I am, Lord, send me. And, and we don't, again, want to miss the opportunity of that day. Last question, third question, we'll wrap it up with this. Why do you care? Why do you care? In the third verse, he, he gave us a motivation to care. Oh, it's a traditional closing in a greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But in a morally compromised, highly competitive, individualistic setting, the gospel shined with a clear distinction to the prevailing mores, grace and peace. You see, apart from God's grace, we'd still be lost, all of us, suffering the fate of our sin, which is death, separation from God. But God in Christ loved us, found us, and drew us to himself, showing us a way out, giving us an opportunity for life. And that opportunity for life provides a solid foundation. We're not constantly treading water trying to keep our chins above the world's test. No, we've got a solid foundation to stand on, giving us a reason to live, reminding us that His grace-filled gospel is the only hope for this world. That's why we should care. Grace and peace. You see, in the midst of chaos, we can have peace. In the midst of moral lawlessness, we can have peace. And in an every-man-for-himself world, we can have peace. No, not the absence of conflict, but the abiding presence of Jesus Christ. And let me go back to where I started this morning with, with the reason I was drawn to this letter. There have been times, many times in recent months, where I was a bit overwhelmed by what's happening, all the things that were happening at one time. And wanted to just get away. I didn't know where to. I didn't have a destination in mind. I just was tired of dealing with it. And I wanted to get away. I'm old enough to remember the Calgon commercial, and many of you are too. I've had those moments over and over. Calgon, take me away. I'm tired of dealing with COVID. I'm tired of answering questions about that immorality or the other immorality. I'm tired of trying to, to fix problems that perplex me and bedevil me that I feel ill-equipped to fix. Just God, take me away. Now, let me just reassure you if you need reassurance. I've never been suicidal. I've never written out a resignation. I, I've not wanted to quit what I'm doing. I just was tired of doing it. And guess what? Grace and peace. Grace and peace. On those days, and it, it didn't last long. It doesn't last forever. It doesn't, it's not protracted periods of down in the dumps. It, it's just moments. And in those moments when, when I you know, turn it around on me. I, I'm tired. I'm weary of this. I don't want to do this anymore. The Lord says, hold on a minute, bub. This isn't yours. This is mine. You didn't choose this. I picked you and we're not done yet. And by the way, this gig that you've got is the best gig you're ever going to find. I don't mean just being pastor of First Baptist Church. I mean the life of walking with Jesus Christ. He said, you're not going to find a better gig anywhere out there, so you just shut up. It's a very spiritual shut up that he gives me, a very kind shut up that he gives me. But, I mean, it comes across loud and clear. Clint, shut up. I am sick and tired of your whining, sick and tired of your negativity. Shut up. And take a little dose of peace and realize I'm with you. And so this is the way it works in that moment. You know, and, it, and I'm, I can anthropomorphize God if I want to. And, and it's kind of like in those moments, he's right there over my right shoulder. And I can turn and look and he'll go, I'm still here. And I'll get into one of those eyeball deep situations and look. and He'll say, I'm still here. And I'm not going anywhere. And as long as I'm here, it's going to be okay. And we're going to get through this. And we're going to be the church in this. And you're going to find my joy in this. Just stay with me. Just stay with me. Now, if you're here this morning and that relationship with Christ sounds attractive, you want to talk about that, I invite you. Call, text me, email me. Let's get together and visit. If, uh, if you think today, Clint, I'm there, man, I, I know God's been speaking to me, and, and I, I'm ready. I need to publicly profess my faith in Christ. I've settled that. I, I know that He's in my heart. I know He's forgiven my sin. And I know today 
that I need to be connected to a group of people who are walking together serving Him. If that's the case, I invite you to come. If you're not ready, I just challenge you to keep praying. Keep asking yourself the questions and let God's truth guide you in those answers. All right? Pray with me. Thank you, Father, that you've been here from the beginning. Uh, You've worked in this service in music, in prayers, in the fellowship of believers. You're, You're just here. And as we leave here and go out there and have another collision or two or three, I pray that we're ready and that we'll be more ready in the days to come. Bless this invitation, Father. I ask that in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.